I'm a female corrections officer, prison guard or CO you may have heard, in a state with a relatively high number of death row inmates, however few executions are actually carried out. I used to work for a large county but I work for a different agency now. This county was my first CO job years ago and before I had worked in retail and customer service while I studied criminal justice so I was really green. I used to be very liberal. I still am liberal about a lot of things, but the job does change your perspective on most people. One thing I used to believe very strongly was that no human being could be truly evil. This particular county jail is one of the oldest in the country, so parts of it have a totally linear layout. What I mean is that you have a long stretch of corridor with cells on either side, and the CEOs have to walk up and down to supervise the inmates. As you can imagine, these linear layouts are not in style anymore because you cannot see every cell at the same time, but every inmate can see you. I have to say that units like this are extremely creepy too. I'm going to call this corridor the condos, which we didn't actually call it that, but I don't wish to share the exact term which is specific to this jail. Now less than 10 years ago, a quadruple stabbing homicide happened not far from where I grew up. The murderer, Michaels, described it as a butchering and he killed his former girlfriend, her family and their neighbor because he came over when he heard the screams. When the police found Michaels soaked in blood and asked him what had happened, he said, It's obvious. I just killed everyone. The cop said that he seemed completely emotionless when he said it. At that time, I've only been a CEO for about four months and our facility received him as a pre-trial detainee. Now, obviously he wasn't our first or only murderer, but the nature of the crime, stabbings indicate a more dangerous personality than a shooting for one thing, and his lack of remorse was horrifying. He was considered a volatile inmate, so we placed him in an observation cell in the middle of the condos where a CO could always keep an eye on him. He would stand at his glass door in silence most of the day, just watching everyone. I swear he only really spoke when he had visits. He actually had a full visitor list of these big goth girls who would come in and swear they were in love with him. I don't know if it means anything, but his ex was a big girl and he used to draw pictures of the fat female COs. For note, he was skinny and white with brown hair. One day, I was working as a utilities officer basically a floater who relieves people for breaks and helps out as needed. At this jail, utilities officers also got away with a ton of downtime and BSing. I was hanging out at one end of the condos where you could look down and see a lot of the jail, talking to another officer on duty. As they say, there are no secrets in jail. Plus I was aware that there were points throughout the jail where you could hear very well into neighboring cells, that sort of thing. We were being pretty quiet though, Plus we stood a good 50 yards from Michael's observation cell. Also, you have to imagine it would be difficult to stand in the observation cell and press your face against the glass to see the people standing at a right angle so far from you. I was telling the other CEO a funny story about my weekend, which I wouldn't do out on a correctional unit nowadays, but we weren't getting into anything too personal either. It was a long story involving my fiancé at the time. I wrapped up talking to the CEO because I had to go to a gate to relieve another officer for Chow and I had to pass Michael's cell. I didn't like walking past it because he stood there and stared at you and back then I wasn't so good at hiding my nervousness. He always had his head slightly tilted down so you could see white under the irises of his eyes, again really saying a word. But today was different. I took one step past his door and I heard him say, Edgecombe, in a barely audible whisper. I didn't even know he knew my name. Yes, our last names are on our uniforms, but I was never his primary officer and we'd never interacted. It caught me off guard, so instead of ignoring it, it stopped me in my tracks and I backpedaled to the door. He pointed to his mouth and I leaned in to listen. His eyes looked so dark, I remember I felt hypnotized. He proceeded to recite word for word the story I had just quietly told the other officer at the end of the condos less than two minutes before. 
even copying the sound of my voice down to a subtle lisp. This seemed to go on forever. I felt like we were the only two there. No 22 millimeters of glass protecting me, just a five foot tall female and a murderer. I remember thinking for the first time of another human being. This is evil and unfixable. Finally, I said, Sir, did you need something? He started to laugh hysterically, and I walked away. I have been assaulted by other inmates. I've had piss thrown in my eyes. People play mind games with me constantly. I've met some damn good lip readers too, but this was like something else. Now I work at a maximum security institution where I babysit all rapists and murderers and pedophiles. I don't know how to make it make sense to you that this was the one and only time in my life where I felt inside of me like I was dealing with something not human. Michaels is in another institution now. He is on death row. He refuses to appeal. He made it clear to the press that this decision is not out of remorse. He has none. He just doesn't give a shit and it is the most logical in his mind for him to die. The main incidents accounted here happened over a year ago, and I distanced myself from the places where they occurred, and therefore haven't really thought about it in a while. I had even stopped living in fear until what happened last night. I live in Louisiana and one of my mom's close friends asked her if I was available to help him with his work. He's an accountant and worked at several offices. He's very kind but socially very strange. This is literally all I knew. I said sure. Having been sick of working in cafes, I jumped at the opportunity to work for a close family friend. He called me shortly after and asked if I could start Monday and I said yes. He seemed pretty frazzled on the phone and briefly explained that he needed help adjusting accounts, writing letters, filing, normal office stuff. He gives me the address and I drive there a few days later to begin work to find that it's a giant beige warehouse in a pretty desolate town half an hour away, on a street completely empty aside from two other warehouses. The glare from the sun reflected off the white gravel makes it hard to see, but I notice a glass door facing the street. I walk up to it and knock on the glass door. A man in his mid-forties immediately walks up and greets me with a joyous and wild smile. I tell him who I am there to see. He beckons someone from behind him and he is instantly flanked by two other men and all three of them are scanning me meticulously with crazed and excited looks in their eyes that I have never seen before. One of them says, You gotta go to the other door, sweetheart, and points to the pool bar on my side of the door. A thick chain is binding the door shut. I notice also that a sturdy metal screen covers the door from their side. Pretty weird, but this is Louisiana so I walk to the other doors and enter. Hmm, security guards lazing behind a front desk encased in plexiglass, men being patted down. Moments later I'm in my new employer's office who explains to me that this is a privatized prison. I am stunned that he didn't think of mentioning to me, a young woman, that I would be working in a prison. But really the opportunity to see the prison system from this side, and especially a privatized prison, fascinated me so much. I couldn't turn down such a unique opportunity, so I stayed. In that first week it became obvious that so many things were not right here. A few examples, the sheriff's office does routine drug alcohol tests that are also supposed to be conducted as soon as any inmate leaves the prison and gets back from work. But each time the police do a random test, they find on average one-fourth of the inmates have been using drugs or alcohol. At one point when I was working there, a man literally walked out the front doors, passed security, stole a van, the keys were inside, abducted his girlfriend, raped and beat her nearly to death in the van, and then disappeared into the forest. The staff who allowed this to happen showed zero remorse and no one was fired. I should have left then. The layout of the place. You walk in, security office to the right, door on your left leads to my office. It will be important later to know that only myself, my boss, and one other person are ever in this office. 
Continue down this hall and it opens up into a main room lined with commissary, a few other offices, and makeshift barracks that house the 300 inmates. There is a hallway on the right about midway into the main room. To get into this hallway, you have to pass through two heavy doors that immediately slam shut again if you are able to pry one open. Down this hallway is the one bathroom for staff. So as a lady, in order to use the bathroom I have to walk into the main room so every inmate can stare at me, wrench open that ridiculous door, hope no one is on the other side because the only people that are generally over there are inmates. The security team is famously incompetent as you just learned and rush to close the flimsy bathroom door that can literally be opened with a fingernail. For this reason I never ate or drank anything. For this reason I was exhausted and simultaneously terrified there every single day. Why stay you are undoubtedly asking. Like I said, my boss was very kind to me and he grew attached to me in the way a father would. He would often try to make sure I was happy, bringing me lunch every single day, but we were both very conservative people and if I told him I had been feeling unsafe, I felt as though that would make him upset with himself. It's a strange feeling that sounds insane now that I verbalize it, but what can I do? Anyway, knowing I speak German and in an attempt to entertain me I guess, my boss asked if I wanted a German pen pal. Finding someone who speaks German in rural Louisiana is pretty tough, so I said yes. He said, I'll have him come over around lunch. At noon, an older obese black man with a kind smile comes to the door. He greets me in German and hands me a note that he wrote for me asking me to be his pen pal. He explains that he learned German when he was stationed there. We continued talking in German and then switch over to English when he said, So, can I write you? I looked at my boss for any sign of how to respond to this, because he's clearly an inmate, and my boss smiles and nods encouragingly, so I say sure. A week later I'm at work and I made the mistake of having to pee once during an 8 hour shift, so I make my way to the bathroom, open that heavy door, squeeze through to the other side, and then I see my pen pal standing right in front of the bathroom door as the steel door closes with a noise not unlike that of a ceiling of a crypt. He asked if I received his letter, and I said no. Feeling a little uncomfortable that he cornered me back here, I say, well, until then, and hurry to the bathroom. The next day is my day off and I had plans to meet with a friend. As I'm heading out the door, I noticed a few letters from me. It was around my birthday, so I grabbed them and decided to read them while I waited for my notoriously late friend to arrive at the coffee shop. Two were from friends and family, but one was written in an unusual script that I have never seen before. I opened the envelope to find three pages of worn college textbook paper folded up. I read the first sentence in disbelief. I read the sentences that followed, shaking and crying in the sunshine. He had found out where I lived. I ran to my car and started driving with no destination. I was terrified. My friend called a few minutes later asking where I was. I went back to the coffee shop and showed her the letter. I never read it again and honestly don't wish to revisit it. None of it was in German. What I remember about it was he told me he was a sexy black man who was in good shape, although I distinctly remember he is definitely not that, and that I should send him pictures of myself, writing back using a pseudonym so no one at the prison learns about us, and that I should sneak him in some of his favorite tobacco because he prefers hand-rolled cigarettes. I was horrified unsure of how to approach the situation in my panic. I decided, however, that I would tell security and my boss the next day at work. When I go in the following morning, my office is in chaos. One of the owners of the prison recently had a divorce and bought a red Corvette with company money. This actually happened, so we were going through the bank statements trying to account for every charge. I figured I would wait until lunch to bring it up, since it was already such a high-stress environment. At some point in the morning, my boss and the other person in my office go to the attic to put some boxes up. It is a fucking rare occurrence that these people are not glued to their desks. A minute later, the door opens, and it's my pen pal. He immediately shuts it behind him and locks it. 
He looks down at me, excitedly. Did you get my letters? He asks. I'm shaking and terrified, but I say, Yes, I got your letter. How did you get my home address? You were never to contact me there again. You were never to enter this office again. You were never so much as to look at me again. His reaction surprised me greatly. He looked down at his hands and made what seemed to be a sincere apology and that he would leave me alone now. He left the office before anyone arrived and I quit at lunch. I was traumatized and didn't feel like rehashing things to anyone, so I just left without telling anyone, knowing my lease would be up soon and he would no longer know where I lived. Flash forward to now, I'm living with my boyfriend applying to grad programs and loving our new place together. I'd never felt unsafe there until last night. He was at band practice and I was alone in the front room with the curtains drawn, leaving just a sliver between them. We have an intense fucking LED motion light that goes off when someone is about two feet from the door. You have to walk like 11 feet from the street and then up some stairs to get to our door so it's not really going to accidentally go off. I notice a bright light from between the curtains. At first I think maybe someone accidentally went up the stairs or some homeless guy is rooting through our ashtray and I write it off. Five minutes later it goes off, then on again. At this point I'm afraid. I get up and dial 911 without calling so it's ready in my phone just in case. I hear the doorknob turn. I text my boyfriend asking if he's at the door and he says no. I listen to someone fiddle with a knob for about two minutes and then they left. I'm terrified, so my boyfriend comes home. When he gets back, we examine the porch together and come up with nothing. Finally, we sit down for a cigarette, and when I go to stub mine out, I notice the butt of a hand-rolled cigarette. None of my friends smoke hand-rolled cigarettes. I'm trying to figure out who could have left it when I remembered my pen pal asked me to sneak tobacco in for him. A wave of nausea rushes over me. I think he should still be in jail. I'm not sure. I save the butt in a bag. I'm going to give it to an officer who is a friend. I don't know what else to do. Let me preface this by saying that I'm a correctional officer. I'm female and about 5 foot 3. I've worked in a large county jail for going on 13 years now, and in my time there, I've had some harrowing experiences and met some extremely creepy and violent individuals. However, all of the strange situations I've been in, there's one I find especially disturbing in retrospect. I was 20 at the time and barely off of probation. I was young and stupid and didn't have the experience needed to truly understand how dangerous my job was at that point. I was working the night shift, 10.30pm to 7am, locked in a room with dozens of inmates and nothing but a handheld radio to protect me. The pod I was assigned to housed 72 inmates. State law says you're supposed to have one officer for 48 inmates. In actuality, we have two pods side by side with 72 inmates each. There's one officer assigned to each pod and a third officer who's supposed to float back and forth between the two housing units. This third officer is hardly ever present until lunchtime. They're inevitably assigned to some other random detail in the facility, escort inmates, supervising trustees, etc. Now, you might assume that jails are divided by types of criminals, i.e. misdemeanors housed separately from felons, but this is only the case after someone goes to court and gets convicted. Most people in county are still awaiting trial so they're all mixed up together. The guy with the unpaid parking tickets might be cellmates with a murderer. You never know, so you never really know who you're dealing with until you look them up. To paint a picture of the environment, the pod itself is a lot like a college dorm. There's a large central day room with two tiers of individual rooms circling the perimeter. There's a stairway on either side of the pod leading to the second tier. Right beside one stairway is the bathroom shower area. Now, this is what we call a direct inmate supervision setup, so the officer is locked in the pod with the inmates. Theoretically, your sister pod next door should be keeping an eye out on you. 
there's a glass wall between the two pods, but in reality, they usually don't have time to remember you even exist. Back in the day, we locked all the inmates into their cells every night at midnight and they stayed in until breakfast time around 4am. On the day this story occurred, I was assigned to a floor that housed male inmates. We have both males and females in the facility. My relief officer, Officer Smith, was out and about on some other assignment so I was alone at midnight. I told all the inmates to rack down and they scattered off in different directions to their cells. When the day room appeared to be empty, I stood up to go do a security check, i.e. check all the doors and make sure they were locked. I started on the far side of the pod away from the bathroom area and walked upstairs. I went around the catwalk making sure each cell door was properly secured. My sister pod was undoubtedly doing the same. The day room appeared deserted as I made my way past the cells. I circled the catwalk, happy for the peace and quiet that I knew I'd be getting for the next four hours. I was walking along, oblivious, not paying any attention to anything other than the doors I was checking. I approached the head of the steps and began to take a step down. As my foot hit the top step, I heard a loud pounding on the pod door. Boom, boom, boom. Startled, I snapped to attention and looked out over the catwalk to the door. Officer Smith was standing there and he was pointing dramatically to the foot of the stairs. I heard him yelling but couldn't make out what he was saying. About that time, I see someone dart out from behind the stairs, butt naked, and run across the day room. Apparently, a large well-muscled inmate had been hiding behind the shower curtain while I did my rounds and had crept out to wait beneath the stairs and... I assume ambush me as I came down them. The inmate played it off as a prank and nothing was done to him. I was good and scared, and to this day I still keep a close watch on my stairways when I'm doing rounds. Maybe he was just planning to scare me, but I'll never know. If Officer Smith hadn't returned at just the right minute, there's no telling what might have happened to me. Okay, so I go to a kind of program for people recovering from mental illness, similar to group therapy. There's this woman who goes there who has a brother in prison. One day, she casually mentioned him to me and she was saying that he was wanting someone to write to because he was lonely and asked me if I would. I told her I wasn't comfortable with the idea and she dropped it. A few weeks later, she came to me with about five or six letters from the guy. I decided to look them over, but I waited until I got home. The letter said that she had been telling him all about me and he wants to be with me when he gets out. He started saying he was in love with me and he wants to be my son's new daddy. It was so creepy. I was going to post them all on here but I was so creeped out I gave them back to her. I believe I have one of them posted somewhere. They were saying I should come visit him in prison and that I should send a picture of myself to him so he can show off his woman. I had never seen this man. I have never met him. I brought them to her and told her I was very uncomfortable, and she said she would tell him I was not interested. This was months ago. A couple of days ago, she brought me another letter from him. She told me she read it over, and it wasn't creepy, so I felt better. But when I read it, he was still saying he was desperately in love with me, that he thinks of me every day, that he is my son's father, and he actually asked me to be his girlfriend. I'm actually kind of scared of this guy, and I don't want him near me or my son. Back in the 60s, my dad worked as a guard at a prison near Miami. He described his most memorable experience to me recently. He says that there was one prisoner who was a lot like a younger Hannibal Lecter. Very calm, but very menacing. He always kept his cool no matter what, but there was something threatening about him. Well, one day, young Lecter was able to start a riot on his cell block purely by motivating the other prisoners into a frenzy. He didn't participate in the riot at all, he got every other prisoner to start a fight in their cell. My dad and a few other guards were called down to the cell block to quiet them all down. He says that when he got down there, 
Every prisoner was screaming and throwing themselves against the walls of their cells and shouting profanity and insults to the guards. That is, every prisoner except Lecter. He was the only quiet one on the whole block. My dad came up to close his cell, and this guy was standing near the back with his hands folded, staring my dad directly in the eye and muttering a random sequence of numbers with a strange smile on his face. My dad stood there, trying to figure out what the numbers meant, and then it finally hit him. The prisoner was reciting my dad's home phone number on repeat. I grew up going to a private American school in a foreign country in Europe, which I shall not name. The school was situated kind of in the middle of a big hill, and even further above the school was something really special, an abandoned prison. Now as if that was not shady enough, bordering the abandoned prison was a real prison. There was kind of like a wall separating the real prison from the abandoned one. So, us being teenagers, we decided to find a way to break into the abandoned part. The brick wall that created the perimeter around the prison yard was broken down due to decay and probably vandalism. We decided to enter and do some exploring. Now this happened over the course of many, many months, and it took us ages to work up the courage to finally get inside. A bunch of us were doing AP 2D art and had our cameras with us at all times to get some shots. Half of my best work came from this prison but one day an event happened that made all of us swear to never go back. So as months and months went by, we got more and more confident wandering around the prison. We never went too deep, and we were always scared of getting close to the wall with the real prison because there was always security guards. Sometimes we would run into some gypsies scraping for metal, sometimes a random homeless person or two, but nothing ever dangerous. Once a couple of guys separate from ourselves got busted by security and we didn't go back for weeks. But eventually we learned the schedule of the guards and befriended the homeless who hung around there so we were pretty comfortable. Two years went by of some exploring here and there until one night a friend and I decided to go there to do some late night shooting. We dressed up, organized our things and met by one of the entry holes at midnight. Now we had videos of us going through some of the sections of the prison this night, but we deleted them out of fear. We never wanted to have anyone know what happened this night and thought the videos could be traced. It was really, really dark in the depths of the prison, so the reason we were filming was to use the flashlight on our iPhones. This was a while back and you couldn't just press a button to get the light, but you had to film something. Our goal tonight was to get as high up as we could, there were at least something like 10 floors and almost all the staircases we found during our daily exploring were sealed off. If we spent lunch breaking one down, the next day it would be repaired again. The prison was huge and had many staircases all over the place. Now most of the rooms were fairly large. Each floor was completely different to the previous one and it was very hard to tell what went on here. From what we could gather, it was some sort of a labor factory that the prisons were forced to work in. We found some rooms completely full of shoe soles. Another floor had a long hallway, and each room was vividly painted in different patterns. Some rooms had a lot of mattresses stacked on top of each other. You get it, a whole lot of creepy-ass rooms with random creepy-ass shit. Every new floor we explored was a totally new surprise and it kept becoming more and more difficult to find ways to go higher up, but eventually we found it, and that's what we came there to do that night, get to the roof. As I mentioned, the prison was on a hill, so the view was bound to be fantastic, and we thought at night the guards will have a harder time spotting us, so back to the night. We kept getting deeper and deeper, and it got darker and darker. There were dripping noises everywhere around us, and we couldn't tell if we were alone. We got to our desired staircase and as we climbed up, there became fewer and fewer windows until we were left climbing into pitch darkness. I'm shaking as I'm even typing this remembering the pure terror I felt. Nonetheless, it was the only unsecured entrance so we kept climbing and climbing. Things started to get weird though. The stairs were in the form of a zigzag with no railing so you could fall down in the middle. To get to the staircase, he had to go through a long and dark hallway, 
So once you're at the bottom of the stairs, there is almost no light. Soon we began to realize that at the end of each zigzag, there were these holes in the wall. To get through one, you'd have to pull yourself up into it because it was just a tiny slit at the top. We flipped a coin and it was decided I was to go through. I wish I never had. I pray to God I never had. I crawled through and hopped inside into a box-like confinement with no windows or anything. You couldn't fully stand up. You had to either lay down or squat. I looked around and found pornography plastered all over the walls of this place, as well as tissues and other disgusting stuff. Injection needles were among one of those things there too. That wasn't the worst part though. The worst part was when I took a look at a notebook laying on the ground. The writing was in a foreign language which I could read and it documented a worker's logs. There was a name followed by a sign in and sign out timestamp. The most recent entry was made two days ago. Two fucking days ago. I rushed out of that space like my life depended on it and told my friend we've got to get going. While I was inside my friend noticed that there was one of these slits on every level and that they were numbered and had a placeholder for a tag. They were cells. We noped the hell out of there and began climbing down when I reasoned to my friend it was almost 1am and we need to go up now before it's too late. We were going to a club after this, us being teenagers you know. It took me some time but I finally persuaded him to go up and make it to the roof and then leave. We went up and up and up until finally we saw light. Delighted, we burst through the door completely without thinking and began expressing our relief and cries of joy. We felt like we had conquered the worst part and completely relaxed. Everything was going great until suddenly my friend freezes in his tracks and tells me to shut the hell up right now and get to the staircase. Panicked, I asked him what he was on about. The staircase we had just come from had like a little house over it if that makes sense and he was looking at something over the edge of the corner. Then I hear another voice, which is definitely not my friend's. We were both these two fairly well-off kids from American upbringings, and the man was speaking a foreign language. Luckily, I could understand it, but we liked to frequently pretend that I did not just to fuck with the locals and spy on people. He was used to me routinely pretending I don't understand a word, so when the man said something, he just stayed quiet and motioned that I keep my mouth shut. My friend was signaling for me to get to the staircase when I hear the man yell, Don't move! In the foreign language, I froze dead and didn't know what to do. Five men come from around the house thingy into my sight. Two were standing, the others were sitting on the edge of the roof. One push and they tumbled down to their death. Now these guys look serious. Pumped arms, sweatpants, bandanas, and for the best part, swastikas on their arms. The prison had a lot of racist, anti-Jew, anti-immigrant, anti-people in general type of stuff going on. This we never expected though. The man motions at me and yells, Come here. I nervously tell him in English that I don't understand. I don't know how I thought this would help. But I speak quite a bit of German and I suppose in my logical brain I thought maybe they would do less harm to two Germans. By luck, my friend happened to be Swiss and spoke it fluently. The man yells to us, What language are you speaking? I reply, Deutsch. My friend looks over at me panicking, desperate to know what our next move should be. Ah, Germans. And the group laughs. I hear one of the men say to the others in the foreign language, They've seen the products. The head of the gang looks at us and comes closer. It was really dark so I couldn't see what they had circled around, but there were black gym bags at their feet. Come closer, he says to both of us. We come up closer to the group and the man starts asking us questions in English, who we are, why we are there. He then started asking personal questions, our full names, where we live, etc., the questions were clearly directed at making it easier to find out as much about us as they can. Neither of us had money, but we both had our iPhones on us. We had no idea what they had planned for us next. One of the sitting guys gets up and asks me, Did you see anything? N no. 
I shakingly reply. Then he comes to my friend and asks him the same. For a brief moment I glanced over at the bags and I suddenly wished I would be anywhere but there. Hell, I'd rather be in that cell than there. I wish we had never come back. I think you can guess what was in the bags. Guns. Not just one gun. Multiple. As in bags and bags of what was probably illegal firearms. In a smaller bag to the side there was a ton of rolled up cash. We just stumbled into an illicit firearm deal. The guys now started discussing amongst each other about what they were going to do with us. They didn't know that I understood every single word. One of them kept pleading we were just stupid kids and if they rough us up a little bit we won't tell anyone. Another one insisted that they take us to Gustav. I'm happy I never met Gustav. Meanwhile I was trying to come up with an escape plan. The real prison was visible from where we were standing but by the time the security guards from there would get up here, we would be dead. The staircase where we came from was pitch black and we would stumble our way down and probably die if we made a run for it. Either way, we'd end up dead. So I go for plan C. Mr. Ringleader says to them that one of them should walk us home to see where we really live and threaten us if we tell. That's when I had a better idea. The roofs. I could run back down the stairs but the abandoned prison complex was huge and basically many buildings of different sizes all near each other. You could hop down from roof to roof and escape via that way. Just as one of them starts arguing about taking us to Gustav, one of their phones rings and I take that as my cue. I scream, follow me, to my friend and begin descending down the roofs. No, I know this is stupid logic but I thought that they'd never shoot us near a real prison. It's too risky. It really wasn't too difficult. We just kept jumping on a lower and lower building and eventually we were down. Our feet hit the ground and we began running through the grounds. Since I knew it quite well, I knew exactly where to run to escape to a main road on the other side of the hill. I suddenly heard men yelling in the background and the sound of barking dogs. Security from the real prison must have seen us running and came to see who was there. I screamed to them in the foreign language, there's men and they've got guns. It seemed they already knew we were not the primary concern as they ran in the direction we came from and not where we were going. We didn't stop running until we reached the city center and we didn't return to the prison. We never reported anything that happened and have no follow-up on who the men were. Illegal drugs and stuff were common where we were living, but we never thought we would stumble across an illegal arms dealing. Needless to say, we didn't go back for months. And to think that roof could have been the last thing I saw. Or Gustav's apartment. <laughs>